Uh, shall we open our Bibles this morning to Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 1? As we continue our study through this book of Solomon, you know Solomon as king was given by God a heavenly wisdom like no man before him had possessed. He prayed when he became king after his father David died and said, Lord, I just want wisdom to rule your people and be a godly man. And God gave him that request, and, and he did well early on. If you read the book of Proverbs, that he, much of the front was written to his boy about walking with God, he, you can see and listen and hear God's moving in his heart and, and how he knew the ways of the Lord. But as Solomon became an older man, he married many women, many through political alliances and all, but they all brought their gods with them, and they turned his heart from the one true and living God. So Solomon, in his later years, was found kind of adrift. In fact, this book is a journal of his quest over many years to try to find some kind of happiness and fulfillment and joy where the world finds it, apart from God. And yet he knew the Lord. He just set aside the wisdom that God had given to him. And he, it pops up now and again, but this is kind of a, a journal of his you know, seeking life and hope and purpose apart from God. And Solomon uses authority as king and the wealth that was at his disposal to make sure that every, every hunt for life was without anything being held back. He didn't skimp on it. He really went after it with all of his, you know, with all of his, his determination without restraint. And we've spent months in this book, right? Going through his observations and frustrations and insights. All of them could be boiled down to four major issues that the book covers. Solomon goes back off into the monotony of life. You know, if this is all there is and it just kind of moves along, whether you're here or not, it just plugs along summer, winter, spring, fall. Moon comes up, sun goes up, you know, whatever it is, that's just life. If that's all there is, and he found that a lot as he was making quest in the world, it frustrated him. Um, he looked at the emptiness of human wisdom and how so often, you know, his wisdom, and it was plentiful, just left him without considering God short of what he needed to know. He wrote of the frustration of gaining wealth in the short term and how it really didn't last. And you couldn't even really secure it when you were gone. And he always mentioned at every quest, on, on, uh, this is it, I know this is it. He always comes back to the certainty of death. Just seemed to like bring an end to whatever he was doing here as far as, as hope for life. By the time that he gets to chapter 12 in a few weeks here, he will have gone full circle. <laughs> He'll have gone down every perceivable road where the world runs for answers only to return and say, yeah, it's not there. Are you sure? Did you look everywhere? Yeah, it's not there. And because of that, it's a great book to share with your friends who aren't saved because they're on a quest somewhere to find life. And I guarantee you, whatever they're looking for, Solomon's been there. And you can find those verses and share with them what Solomon discovered. This morning, as we get to the first six verses of chapter 11, Solomon addresses the, the need for the believer to be diligent in serving the Lord because you really don't know what's coming. You don't know what God has planned. And so our limit of... of involvement is to be diligent with what God gives us and then to watch and see what God will do and the danger of the excuses that oftentimes keep us from God's best. This is what it says in verse 1. Cast your bread upon the waters for you will find it after many days. Give a serving to seven also to eight. You don't know what evil will be upon the earth if the clouds are full of rain. They will empty themselves upon the earth. If a tree falls to the south and to the north, in the place where the tree falls, it shall lie. So he who observes the wind won't sow. He who regards the clouds won't reap. And as you do not know what the way of the wind is or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child, so you do not know the works of God who makes everything. So in the morning, sow your seed. And in the evening, do not withhold your hand. You don't know which he will prosper, either this or that, or whether both will be alike, and they'll be good. Solomon, in his observations of life under the sun, notice that sometimes, due to, re, uh, to real or imagined difficulty, or sometimes just anticipated difficulty, people will excuse themselves from doing anything at all. And that there is this natural tendency among men to not be so quick to be willing to sacrifice to gain or to get somewhere. Now he uses a couple of, of fairly obvious examples, verse 1, uh, of setting a, a ship at sea, a sail with, with cargo that is valuable, that belongs to you, sending it somewhere else, and how much of a step of faith that is. Or the farmer, 
whose livelihood is found in sowing and reaping. And then he uses him to illustrate that if the farmer regards the circumstances in which his work is to be done. Oh man, it's windy today, I can't plant the fields. Or on reaping time, well it looks like it's rain, I'll be stuck in the mud. He won't be a farmer for long. In other words, he's got to overcome the natural challenges of life if he's going to do his job. And whether it is high seas for the ship captain or it is bad weather, if you will, for the farmers, those are all given. Rain clouds will bring rain. Dead trees will lay in the way. They're not moving. It's just the given part of life. And because of that, those are challenges that we will always face, only for Solomon to say, works of faith are never done under ideal circumstances. In other words, there's always going to be something that hampers you serving the Lord, something that you can point to and go, well, what about that? Farmer, well, what about the wind? What about the rain? What about the tree right in the road? So I find myself available to excuse after excuse. But three times Solomon says, you don't really know what God's doing. What you can't do is let the circumstances dictate the way you serve the Lord. Excuses for not sowing will eventually become explanations for why you can't reap. And that's the problem. Every venture of faith, every endeavor that the Lord sets before you, it has some inherent danger and risk that comes with it. Because it's an act of faith. We don't know what God is doing. We, we're given certain marching orders. We know the Lord says, do this. We, he, he doesn't tell us what may become of it. He just sets before us the doing of it. And yet, if you are unwilling to risk anything, you will never be fruitful in anything either. There won't be fruit. Because there are certain things that the Lord would have us to do, all of us, that are, are accomplished in the environment of danger and difficulty and, and, and adversity. Statistics tell us that one in every seven of you are going to die of cancer. It's just the way it is. That one out of every 23 of us is going to die of a stroke. And that every 30 minutes, some drunk driver kills another person. It's the facts. Tragic as they are, that's the facts. Now, does that keep you off the road? Are you not driving because you know that to be so? No, I suspect you're driving. You might be thinking about walking home, but they're still the facts. It interests me that though air travel is so much safer than driving, the folks who will climb into their car, do ridiculous speeds in city streets while texting and putting their pictures on Facebook, will not get on a plane for fear they're going to die. <laughs> but roughly over the last 10 years, 1% of every fatality in the U.S. has been automobile related. Only 1 in 20,000 people die in a plane. So your odds are far better to get on the plane and get out of the car. Let me give you something to worry about. You're much like, more likely to die of drowning. One in every 9,000 deaths in America last year was due to drowning. One out of every 5,000 deaths in America last year was due to electrocution. Let me make it really scary for you. One out of every 246 deaths were simply caused by someone falling down. One out of every 246 people. So here's the deal. Don't get up. <laughs> Stay put. Don't touch nothing. Don't move. Settle in. I tried that with my wife. I was out of tea the other night watching TV. I said, honey, could you get me some more tea? I'm afraid for my life to walk into this. <laughs> it didn't work. Look, most of us are willing to risk it to live. We don't succumb to the fear of possible difficulties, remote as they are. And then as Christians, we have that added benefit of knowing God's in charge of our lives. So we look at all of those things, those are realistic facts, and then we say, yeah, but the Lord's in charge of my life. He knows what, what's coming. He, he's went ahead before me to prepare the way, and so I have even more diminished, if you will, danger or difficulty to face because the Lord is with me. Unfortunately, that attitude of, of laissez-faire and, and necessary risks and I'll trust God oftentimes immediately go missing when God wants us to serve him. Then we go immediately to verse 4, and we begin to observe the wind and regard the clouds. 
And we immediately begin to find reasons why we can't serve him. Oh, Lord, if you only knew. And the principle is laid out for us here. The philosophy of observing the winds and the clouds, invoking the flimsiest of excuses why we can't step out in faith today, is the bane of the church and of the saint. There's nothing wrong with being aware of potential difficulty, but that shouldn't stop your movement. The, the ocean liner captain knows that he, if he's going out to open ocean, there's certainly going to be times of storms that he may have to face, but he's leaving. And the airplane pilot who takes the million pound 747 into the skies and he's going to fly you halfway around the world knows you're going to hit a bump or two along the way. But those are challenges that you overcome, not difficulties that keep you from going. Our calling from God is found in verse 6. We should not be slowed down or dissuaded by the wind or the clouds. And oftentimes we are. Maybe the problem is one of selfishness. I, 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 I thought about this this week and I thought, I can't imagine having to encourage any Christian to have to set aside their own life so that they can serve the Lord. He's done so much for us. I have no life without him. He has sent his only son to die in my place. I'm pretty much in debt to him for the rest of my life. And then for eternity as well. But I'm only asked to serve him here and to make that choice. But I think selfishness has a lot to do with our unwillingness to risk. I read somewhere that the smallest package is someone who is wrapped up in themselves. And I think that's true. Everything around our life is is self. We have self-motivation and self-help and self-reliance. We're self-made man. I'd rather do it myself. There's self-esteem. You know, the gimme, gimme, gimme. It's all about me anyway, right? And my needs are more important than the group as a whole. It, it, it ravages us and it creeps its way into the life of the saints as well. We've had personalized license plates for many years, but did you know that when that opportunity to get one first came out in Illinois the first day of application. They had 1,100 applications for the license plate that simply said number one. <laughs> 1,100 people wanted number one on their car. The guy who was working there at the DMV said to others later, I felt so bad. I, I didn't want to disappoint you know, that many people, so I gave it to no one. I kept it for myself. <laughs> True story. Well, that problem started back in the Garden of, of Eden when Adam and Eve applied for that license plate with God at the advice of another. And it started years before then in heaven in Isaiah 14 when an exalted angel named Lucifer applied for the number one license plate for his own little deal. And he was told to take a hike to get out. Since the fall of man, every succeeding generation, we just clamor for ourselves. We... We really don't know what it means to risk life and limb for the sake of others or for the glory of God. Or what seems to be life and limb and, and, and rarely is. I read a story of a little boy and girl who were at the shopping mall with their parents and they had one of those electric horses that you could put a quarter in and ride. And so they both climbed on and pushing each other out of the way. They both got on and put the quarter in, but neither one of them were happy, you know. And finally the little boy said to the, to the little girl, you know, if one of us would get off, there'd be more room for me. I thought, well, that makes perfect sense. You know, that, that would be nice if it stopped with kids, but it doesn't because we kind of pick up where Adam and Eve left off. We all want to be number one, don't we? We want to be number one into the parking lot, number one into the movie theater, number one off the plane. I always imagine, I was interested in the way people get off planes. Stand up and they push each other out of the way and the doors close. Where are you going? I don't know. I've got to get off. I'm ready to go, you know. And, and maybe you, when you're driving, you finally get a lane that's clear. It's yours. Oh, I'm number one. And then some bozo pulls around. Oh, hey. Now you're disappointed you're number two again, you know. Well, Solomon was number one for a long time. And he really set out to find out what number one would do for him, what he could get under the sun. And he found out it wasn't much. He said it was vanity. What do we call these plates? Vanity plates. <laughs> Just like Solomon. Emptiness. Well, here's the solution. and It's found in six verses, and it's an important one to learn. But it's going to ask you to go out and serve the Lord and by faith take risks and be adventurous and be willing to go as God directs you and just wait to see what God might do and not so much think about what might be in your way as you go. The word casting in verse 1 really means to send out or to send forth. The word in Hebrew means to have an open hand, 
to be generous. And it's used sometimes in terms of giving and finance, but it is used in the sense of, of being willing to give out rather than simply, uh, if you will, to take in, to, to be generous. And in verse 2, you, you find that, that poetic style again, and we've mentioned it before, where there's an increase in number. Give to seven, no, give it to eight. And we've told you before that when numbers increase in Hebrew poetry, it's like putting an exclamation point behind something in English. That's the way they, they, they emphasize. So um, Solomon says, not only should you be open to serve and to give and to, and to place things in the water, to let things go, if you will, uh, send them forth, but that you should do it in many different ways or to diversify might be a good way of putting it. Just be willing to spread it around, man. Go serve, be generous, be open. Let the Lord use you because you don't really know what's going to become of what you send forth. And notice that that's really the key. You're, the waters will come back. You really don't know what evil might come upon the earth, what might interrupt or slow it down. Verse 3 and 4 is basically the excuse. Verse 5 and 6 is the encouragement. Look, don't let circumstances slow you down. The principle is give of yourself to the Lord and see what God will do with you. Our calling from God is to do these things without being slowed down or without being dissuaded by the winds and the clouds. And, and the point is, believers know that God does the work. We're just vessels for his honor. So that at best, I can sow, but the Lord has to bring harvest. And when there is a, a, an undone part of that equation, it's not his, it's mine. I, I stop sowing because I see potential problems. And that's true throughout the board. Let, let me give you a couple of examples. Um, when was the last time you actually sat someone down, looked them in the eye and said, I want to tell you about Jesus and how you can get saved? When's the last time that happened to you? When you go to Luke chapter 5, um, the Lord tells a, a parable there about, um, no, it's not Luke chapter 5, it's Luke chapter 8 verse 5, about the parable of the sower. You remember that parable? And, and how he said that, that a man went forth to sow a seed, and he said later on, the, the seed is the word of God. And he says, when he goes forth to seed, there are different soils upon which that word falls. And he tells us about a hard path that, you know, it doesn't penetrate and the birds of the air come steal it. He said, these are hard-hearted folks who the enemy has convinced that the truth isn't worth listening to. And it's like, it's like seed landing on cement, it doesn't penetrate. Then there are those who have hearts that are mixed, right? There's so much in the soil that, that, that God's word gets in, but, but the uncertainty of this world and the, the love of riches and the, the cares of the world, they choke the word out. And he says, you know, they're occupied soil that has a lot of stuff in it, so it won't grow. And then there, there's some soil that's not very deep. And so it springs up quickly because there's a lot of warmth, but there's no ability for nutrition. So the minute there's pressure or heat or difficulty, the thing dies. And then there's good hearts that when they hear the word, you know, they listen, they believe, they follow, and fruit is born. And he said, what a wonderful parable. And, and the Lord gives it to the disciples and explains it, but then he puts the cover back over it because what he's telling us is something we normally don't know. We don't know what's in someone's heart. But then he turns to them and says, so go see, sow the seed. And that's the injunction from us, to us from the Lord. Go out and share my word with others. And you might say, well, what if they don't listen? Well, that's going to happen. There's all kinds of different soils and hearts out there. Well, I don't know what kind they are. That's right. So you better just keep sowing because you don't know what God's going to do, but you know what he's called you to do. Go share. It doesn't matter what the response is or how many people react. Your job, go share. That's his calling. And sometimes we don't. We're called to cast our bread. He's called to bring the changes. Now, look, there's plenty of people when I was a young Christian that I wanted to go share with my friends that I determined I wouldn't share with because I knew they wouldn't listen. They are hard-hearted, they're unapproachable, they're argumentative. I just knew if I went to share with them, they were going to lash out at me and I was going to suffer needlessly because they weren't going to listen anyway. So I'm not telling them. But that's not the biblical approach. If the truth be known, that was me before I got saved. And a lot of you. Isn't it good that whoever was praying for you and sharing with you wasn't put off by the clouds and the rain? By what they saw, by the hindrances and the difficulty. To do what God said, to cast your bread on the water, see what the Lord will do with it. And so they stuck with it. Maybe you argued with them. Maybe you insulted them. Maybe you, you made them feel bad. But they didn't go away. And here you are, a, a believer in Jesus Christ, because someone was, was believing that God could use them. They weren't put off. They, 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 they work from the who knows what God might do philosophy of chapter uh, verses 1 and 2 and 5 and 6. While you are working with the least likely to come to Jesus argument. 
Look, observing potential difficulties is always going to be a deterrent to your faith in being used by God, always. You should be looking to the Lord and obeying what he says, rather than looking for reasons not to because of the difficulty. Look, if I know that the Holy Spirit is poured out into the world to share the good news, and if I have the word of God that doesn't go out void, and I believe that I'm being called by God to be his representative, and he gives me a love for the lost, that'll get me doing it even if I have no confidence in me. It'll get me going forward without excuse because the the, the field has been laid out, if you will, by the Lord. But if I just look at the the difficult, look at his scowl, look at his long hair. He's got, a, he's got a tattoo on his forehead. I don't think I can share with him. He could kill me. I found a tree lying in my way. I've listened to the, the wind. <laughs> you and excuses. You and excuses. And so I don't share with him. But I should. David would write in Psalm 126, those who sow in tears, they're going to reap in joy. And if he continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, he will doubtless come with rejoicing, bearing sheaths with him. The problem with those two verses is the word weeping. There's labor involved. There's difficulty involved. There's hardship involved to do what the Lord asks me to do. And so I avoid it with the flimsiest of excuses. Oh, he didn't seem like he was open to hear it. Oh, I don't quite know what to say. Oh, I'm not really prepared. Oh. And I observe the wind, I regard the clouds, and I do not reap. That's what verse 4 says, I will not reap. God doesn't want excuses. He wants willingness. He wants those who will by faith do what he says, even though they don't feel qualified, because God can make of our worst his best. It applies to ministry. You know, all of you are called to a ministry, all of you. Go read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're not all eyes and ears and noses and toes and hands, but you're called to something. And God has a plan for your life. You're unique. But oftentimes when I I begin to encourage folks to get involved and get plugged in, they come up with the dreaded verse 4 dilemma. They say things like this. I can't do that. I don't know anything about that. I don't have the time for that. Excuses. Maybe next year when the kids are out of sports, when the work slows down, when I have more free time, when I feel better, when I know more. Hey, look, here's the deal. Hear the wind, see the clouds, do nothing. Verse 4. Hear the wind, see the clouds, do nothing. Excuse after excuse after excuse. And Solomon says, I see it in the world. (laughs) Unfortunately, sometimes we see it in the church. I I hear excuses from people that I am firmly convinced they don't believe themselves. They just hope you'll believe it. How about next month you go to Mexico for three days and help some kids that have nothing? I can't. How about Sunday afternoon next week you go with the convalescent group and go pray with some folks that are old and neglected and abused and abandoned? I don't know what to say. How about you just go knock on your neighbor's door next week and say, hey, you want to go to church with me? My neighbors? No, you don't understand. <laughs> no, I don't. Cast your bread. Let's see what the Lord will do. I don't know what he's up to. Who knows? There's great potential with God, isn't there? Very little with you and me. And these verses, if nothing else, scream out the words, no excuses. No excuses. Who knows what God will use? So don't be hampered by the inevitable. The rain, the clouds, the tree in the way, things that happen to everyone else, they're going to come anyway. Don't be hampered by the inevitable. God is involved. And, and, and by the way, in God's hands, a few loaves and fish fed thousands. So you haven't even begun to see what God can do. But you'll never see it if you're willing to, not willing to risk it. And people usually hide behind their excuse. I can't. I don't want. I, I, they don't even say I don't want to. They'll just say I can't. What they mean is I don't want to. Notice that in verse 2 and in verse 5 and in verse 6, three times are the words you do not know. That's the motivation. Go serve because you don't know. You don't know what's going to hamper you later on. You don't know what God's going to do with you. You don't know what God's going to bless. But you have marching orders. 
Look, the future is very uncertain and, and it is clouded and life doesn't always go smoothly. Trees fall down. It rains on your parade. Maybe you'll get laid off. Maybe you'll be served divorce papers. Maybe you'll, they'll find some illness that, that, that frightens you. Life, man, is horrible that way. But we serve a God who's powerful. And we are put here to be a witness for him. Job in one day lost property, children, and health. Experiences that could make the man of the world shut down and die, but it didn't with Job. He stayed with it, diligently committed to it, because the tree wasn't moving and the weather will always oppose, but the issue is you and I need to commit ourselves to act in faith even when the conditions are not right and when they're not conducive and when they're not in our favor. What you're not allowed to do is excuse yourself with them. I'm so tired, I'm so busy, I got so much stuff going on. Yeah, yeah. You should hear yourself. Never consider potential difficulties to find the will of God. Get out and do the work. Well, what if God doesn't bless it? Great, then go on to the next thing. You're not being judged by fruitfulness, you're being judged by faithfulness. Well, what if it doesn't work out? Well, then you're exactly where you would have been had you done nothing, except now you get rewarded for stepping out. The problem isn't new. You know, when, when Martha was so angry at Jesus for not showing up by the time Lazarus died in John 11, she, Jesus said to her, Martha, if you'll just believe me, I'll show you my glory. It, it's a cool little sentence Jesus uses whenever he's going to do something godlike, like only God can do it. I'll show you my glory. They get to the graveyard, and he says to the men working there, roll away the stone from Lazarus' tomb. And Martha goes, hey, Lord, bad idea. But in their four days, he's stinking by now. And the Lord said, Martha, I thought I just told you. If you believe me, I'll show you my glory. She argued. On a feast day there in John chapter 5, Jesus came to Jerusalem where the priests were up on the Temple Mount sacrificing one animal after the other to speak about the blood that would cleanse men of sin. And Jesus, the, the, the lamb who was to come, was there. But he didn't go up there. He went down to the pools of Bethsaida where the people were being laid down who were sick. There was a legend going around that every time the water stirred, the first one in the water would be healed. John doesn't endorse that. He just mentions it. That was the belief that brought them all there. And there was a 38-year-old man who had been there, I should say, in his infirmity for 38 years. And he wasn't really able to move. He was paralyzed, so he had no chance. But the people who had cared for him just kind of had laid him there. And Jesus went right to him, of all of the people, went right to that guy and said, do you want to be made whole? Now, I'm thinking after 38 years, the first word out of your mouth should be, yup, amen, you bet. Can you do that? You know what he did? He started telling the Lord about the wind and the clouds in the past. Well, you know, there's this deal, and you know, the stirring, and every time it stirs, there's always a guy cut me off, and I try to get in there, but no one's there to help me. I just, he started telling him about the problems. And the Lord, without further comment, just said, just get up. Arise and walk. Just gave it to him immediately. Just get up and start moving. There was a man with a withered hand that came into the Capernaum synagogue where Jesus was speaking on the Sabbath in Mark chapter 3, and Jesus looked at the Pharisees and he looked at him, according to verse 5, with great anger because they really didn't care about this man. They were hoping Jesus would do something they could accuse him of on the Sabbath. But the last thing they cared about was this poor man with an infirmity. So he looked around in anger. And then he looked at the man. And he said to him, grieved by the hardness of their hearts, stretch forth your hand. Now, if the fellow hadn't been listening, he might have said, you know, you shouldn't pick on those that are infirmed. I have a handicap and you're mocking me. If I could stick out my hand, I'd be fine, but I can't. What he said was, Lord, if the Lord of heaven tells me to do the impossible, I can do this. It doesn't make any sense to me. And so whatever went on in his heart, he went to reach out. And as he did, God healed his hand. It was made like the other. That's all he wants from you. He's not asking you to accomplish great things. He's asking you to be willing to go out when it's raining, when it's cloudy, when there's difficulties, when there's trees in the way, when you can't find a way out, when you don't think you've got what it takes, and just put your bread out there. Lord, use me. Let me go share with this guy. Let me just go and serve. Let me be a person that can stand and pray. 
Oh, I don't have much to give. Of course you don't. Look, if you want me to agree with you that you're worthless, I will. You're worthless. So am I. But he's not. And he can do an awful lot with worthless people that are willing to surrender their lives to him. That's the bottom line. You know, you can, you can ch grab chapter 4 mentality with, with everything. You know, the minute you commit yourself, to, I'm going to get up a little earlier in the morning, I'm going to start praying more. I guarantee you within the week you'll have lots of cloud and rain reports as to why that didn't happen. I'm going to go to church more than just on Sunday mornings and you'll quickly find reasons why you can't make it. And what you fail to do is you never stop to realize the fact that these are oppositions that the enemy wants you to take on. And what might you be like? What might your life be like if you didn't let those things keep you from what God called you to do? That's when you begin to taste and see that the Lord is phenomenal. Look, if, if difficulty brings you to the conclusion that you can't, you can't, then you won't. And if you won't, then he can't. Not with you. Jesus told that story in Luke 14, um, that parable about a king who gave a supper and invited many. And when the supper was ready, he sent out words with his servants, come, it is all ready. And the first fellow says, well, I bought a piece of land. I'd really like to go see if it's any good. It's a lame excuse. Nobody buys a house without walking through it, or you shouldn't. If you are, you're nuts. This wasn't, this wasn't rational reasoning. This was an excuse of the heart. I really don't want to go. The second guy said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, or ten oxen. I want to go see if they can pull anything, or if they're broken-legged. I don't know. Really? You just bought a car, and you don't know if it has an engine. You're brilliant. The third guy is even worse. He says this, well, I just got married. How dare you? Yeah, I can't go to the feast because I just got my, the woman that you gave me. Blaming somebody else. So they came back and they said, well, this guy's got a land, this guy's got the oxen, this guy got a wife. And the master of the house became angry and he said to the servant, I want you to go out quickly then into the streets and lanes of the city. I want you to go to the poor, into the maimed, into the blind, into the lame. And I want you to invite them to come in. And they did. And many came, unrestricted by their unwillingness, though they were weak and unable. And they said, Master, it's done as you've commanded. And he said, well, there's still room. So go out into the highways and the, into the hedges and compel them to come in so that my house may be full. But I say to you, those men who were invited shall never taste of my supper. Pretty heavy duty. You see, the Lord's interest is not that we're not invited. We are invited, but that excuses will keep us from what he wants to do with us. I think that so often you and I fail to experience the power of God and to be able to say, I saw the Lord work today because we will never allow ourselves to be put into a position where he'll have to work. If we're not in control, if we, don't have, if we can't make it happen, then we don't go. And if we don't go, then we'll never see. I understand your hesitancy when you look at you. I just don't understand your hesitancy when you look at him. He's more than able, more than able to do much more abundantly than you'll ever ask or if you'll ever think. Our, our duty is to sow. His is to provide the harvest. And, and so what we have to do is quit making excuses for ourselves because there is tremendous value in being a faith risk taker who is willing, because God has sent me, to go with great adventure and look to see what he's going to do. There's a great verse in Daniel 11. It says, those who do wickedly against the covenant they will be corrupted by flattery, but the people who know God, they will be strong and they will do great exploits. What a great memory verse. It's, it's Daniel 11, 32. Those who know the Lord will be strong and will do great exploits. That's what God wants. So you should be a doer, not an excuse maker. A sower, a, a reaper, a laborer. Have the faith to believe. Go see what God might do with you. It'll be fun to watch someone like you be used by God. God can use me? Yep. Phenomenally so. What's the problem? Verse 4. There's a hundred reasons, a hundred reasons to not do anything. Lord, I'll do it next year. That makes you feel good because you didn't say no. You just said later. God would say now. How do you know you have next year? 
That's really presumptuous of you. You have today. Now go do it. Make it happen. Let's see what God will do with the likes of us. It's going to be awesome. Father, thank you this morning for your word. We certainly don't want to be a people that are, are bent on excuse and living by excuses. To, and even the kind of excuses that if everyone heard them would agree with us. They're reasonable. But yet they're not very spiritual. And knowing that we live a life that has many unanswered questions in terms of what comes next, your counsel to us is pretty clear. In the morning, so. In the evening, so some more. Who knows what you're going to do. But we know you're not going to be able to do anything if we just sit, not with us, and find reasons to not be available. Lord, make us available in these times in which we live, that in a world that so desperately needs to see Christians who are convinced that their God reigns and rules, that his power is beyond our finding out, that he's able to do more than we can ask or think. And put us out there for, for, for those 80% of us that do nothing more than sit in church. Stir us up. And may we be uh, uh, not, not sitting on the sidelines, may we be in the race, in the game, participating, allowing you to use us, calling upon your name to see what you will do with us, to, to see that you can put your glory on display because of the weakness of the vessels that you can use. Help us to see that an excuse is just that. It's an excuse. And Lord, you have much more in mind for us, for all of us than that. Shall we stand?